<clears throat> well, I've already read for you the text, so let me just begin by getting a bit of a running start on what we're looking at this morning. Last week, uh, we saw the angel, remember, speaking to Zacharias in the temple, um, both in answer to his prayers for a child. Remember, he and Elizabeth have been praying for years that the Lord would give to them a, uh, a child. <laughs> but also in answer to the Lord's promise to send the forerunner of the Messiah into the world. The 400 years of God's silence was now being broken, and he was preparing to send uh, his Messiah into the world. Now remember, when the angel first appeared to Zacharias, he was afraid, and so the angel comforted him. You know, remember we saw that uh, seeing an angel in the temple when it's, it's kind of a precarious to be in that situation. He didn't know if the angel was there to kill him because of some sin on his part or whether it was for some other purpose, but the angel comforted him and told him it was an answer uh, to his prayers. But then we saw Zacharias doubt, doubt the words the angel brought to him. Could God really give to him and Elizabeth a child this late in life? And so the Lord, remember, in His grace, decided to teach Zacharias a lesson, one that we are going to see fulfilled this evening. Zacharias would not be able to speak to anyone essentially about this or any other matter until the prophecy was fulfilled, until the child was born, and until the child was named. That was also a part of the prophecy, and it isn't until the child is named that Zacharias' discipline is lifted. Now, the other gracious thing the Lord did was He also did not withdraw the blessing that He had just given to Zacharias. Elizabeth conceived as He had promised, again, because the Lord is good. The Lord knows our weaknesses. He knows that we often struggle to believe, to believe His Word. Even though there's never really a reason to doubt Him, we so often do because we have so little faith. By the way, let me just mention the reason why we have so little faith is because we don't spend as much time in communion with the Lord as we should, and we're all guilty of that. The more time we spend with Him, the stronger we will be in the Lord. The more we'll be filled with His Holy Spirit, the more we will trust Him. But it's good to know that the Lord still loves us even when our faith is weak and He still does what is necessary to keep us moving forward, to keep us growing. Now, we also saw the Lord send Gabriel, secondly, to Mary to tell her the good news that she had been chosen for a very special purpose, and that was to give birth to the Messiah, which meant that she would also be the mother of the Messiah. She would be the one who would raise Him. She didn't know how this could happen. She hadn't yet uh, come together with Joseph. She knew something about what this would mean for her. I mean, while still uh, unmarried to Joseph, uh, what would Joseph think? What would others think when they see her carrying this child? But we saw that Mary also believed that doing the Lord's will was much more important than what people might think. And so she believed, and so she submitted. The Spirit of God overshadowed her. Again, uh, the image that we see here is quite a bit like we read in Genesis 1 where God created the heavens and the earth, but then we see the Spirit of God hovering over the deep and bringing order in this chaos, bringing something new, something that God wanted to bring, you know, wanted to create in the world. We see Him doing the same thing as He's brooding over the Virgin Mary and creating something new, something that is untainted by sin, something holy within her womb. And the Son of God at that point, descends into the world. This is His descent, as we saw. The incarnation takes place. Now, this morning, what we want to see happen next is uh, Mary's visit to Elizabeth, John's response to Jesus' presence when uh, she comes into the room, Elizabeth's response and prophecy regarding Jesus, and we want to see Mary's exaltation of the Lord. Now, first of all, we see Mary hurry to see Elizabeth. Now, we should not assume that Mary went to visit Elizabeth because she also doubted what the angel has said and wanted to see for herself whether or not this was true. 
Mary believed. As a matter of fact, uh, Elizabeth points out when she sees Mary and prophesies, blessed is she who believed what the Lord told her would come to pass. The reason why Mary was coming to visit Elizabeth was because she wanted to rejoice with her. She wanted to tell her what it is that the Lord had also done for her because as far as she knew, Elizabeth knew nothing about it and probably didn't until the moment Mary comes into the room and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. But also then what the Lord was about to accomplish for the both of them and also for all of Israel and ultimately all the nations. Now, when the Lord blesses us, or he blesses others in his mercy. I mean, our response should be, if we have the Spirit of God in us, is to want to rejoice with them, especially when these things have to do with the plan of salvation. Remember, our greatest joy should be when the Lord is, is pleased by what we're doing. That should be motivating us all the time. And that shouldn't be just when we do something that is pleasing to him, but when we see something that is done that is pleasing to him, we should rejoice together as God's people. Now, I think when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, I don't think that she actually knew that Elizabeth was carrying the one who was going to go before her son. I think she was just coming to visit Elizabeth because the Lord had mercy upon her in her old age and was granting her this child. But she did know that she herself was carrying the one who would save them both and wanted to share that with her. Now, secondly, we see Elizabeth and John, when Mary enters into the room, were both filled with the Holy Spirit. I think we see a couple of interesting things here. As soon as Mary greeted Elizabeth, the baby leaped in her womb for joy, and Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit. Now, John reacted in the way that he did because uh, we know that he was also filled with the Spirit of God. Remember what Gabriel said to Zacharias back in verse 15. Speaking about John, he says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. This is the fulfillment of what it is the angel said to Zacharias. Now, let me submit to you that that means that at this point, John was already a new creation in Christ. He was already born again. Uh, we know from the, from the Scriptures that somebody can be empowered by the Holy Spirit without being born again, without being a true believer. We know that King Saul was anointed with the Holy Spirit to be king, and it changed him into another man. Uh, it gave him what he needed to, to be a king, even though he still made a lot of foolish choices. We know the Spirit of God came upon Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, although not at the point at which he betrays Jesus. But he went out with the twelve, and he cast out demons, and he raised the dead, and he performed miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can be empowered by the Holy Spirit without being saved. But you cannot be filled with the Spirit unless you have first been born again by the Holy Spirit. And that's why John responded the way that he did when Mary came near with Jesus. At that point, she was carrying Jesus. The Spirit is the one who makes us love the Lord, and he makes us love the things of the Lord. It's that work of the Holy Spirit that is the reason why we receive, why we find desirable what we read in the Word of God, why we believe it, why we receive it. The Spirit of God is, is the reason why we trust in this one that he sent into the world to save us. He's the reason why we follow and serve the Lord, even though it's not popular. He's the reason why Mary submitted to this plan of the Lord, even though it was going to cast a great deal of aspersion on her personal piety and, and her chastity, right? We do these things because we love the Lord, but we love the Lord because we have the spirit of love within our hearts. Now, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, what that means is that we have more of His influence, and so we love these things even more and are willing to do them even more. John was so full of the Holy Spirit that when he sensed that Jesus was near, and I think that was by the Holy Spirit, it's not that he could hear or see anything that was going on from where he was, but he sensed that Jesus was near by the Holy Spirit, and when he knew that his Lord was near, the one whom he loved more than any other, 
He leaped in the womb for joy. Now, this is also why our Lord commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that we will love Him more and serve Him more. We're commanded to be filled. Now, one thing I just want to mention is this reaction on John's part is not, is not the, the rule, okay? This is not the way it is with children who come into the world. This is an exception, a very notable exception. The Bible tells us that we don't come into the world already spiritually alive and filled with the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, we don't even come into the world innocent. We come into the world guilty, guilty of Adam's sin. Remember, the sin of Adam brought death to the whole human race. We come into the world spiritually dead, which means averse from the things of the Lord. We wouldn't rejoice if Jesus was in the room. We would not like it for him to be in the room. That's just the way our hearts are when we come into the world. And we also come into the world then, um, again, without any love for the Lord. Why did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. It's not enough to be born simply the way everybody is born who comes into the world. You need the rebirth. You need that change of heart. Well, how can that happen? Only by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is the one who brings life. He raises from the dead. The Spirit of God is the one who gives us that love for the Lord. And He's the one who also influences how strong that love is going to be, how much of His influence we actually have. And as I mentioned before, if you have the Spirit of God, you can strengthen that influence by communing with the Lord, worshiping Him more. Now, thirdly, we see Elizabeth's prophecy. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting and John had leaped in, in her womb, she also was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to proclaim in a very loud voice in verses 42 and 43, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? I want you to notice that Elizabeth said something here that she really had no way of knowing apart from the Spirit of God revealing it to her. This was essentially a word of knowledge. It was a prophecy, a prophetic, you know, again, a prophetic utterance. Okay. Uh, one thing, again, we see Luke doing. He is giving us uh, windows. He's get, showing us pictures of what's going on here that none of the other gospel writers have shown us. And he's showing us the involvement of, of the women in particular in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here are a couple of very important uh, views or pictures of this. Now, she knew that Mary was blessed among all women, that she had been singled out to bear and to care for the Son of God, and that this baby that she was carrying was no mere baby, but, of course, was the eternally blessed Son of God, the Lord's Messiah. I don't know if you, if you recognize this here, but what Elizabeth says actually f forms the basis of what in history and, and actually today is called the Hail Mary. You know, sometimes we think of Hail Mary as that last-ditch effort to, to win a game. You know, it's a Hail Mary pass or whatever. But this is the basis of a prayer that is called the Hail Mary, uh, which is an important part of Roman Catholic piety. It's a part of their rosary. Now, as Protestants, we would certainly agree that Mary is blessed. I mean, blessed to be used this way. Singled out among all the women in the world to, to give birth to the Messiah. Uh, that was quite a privilege. Uh, we also agree that she was blessed because she believed the Lord, that he was going to do what he said he would do through the angel and didn't doubt in the way that um, Zacharias doubted. And we certainly agree that the fruit of her womb, Jesus, is blessed he is the eternally blessed one who has come into the world in our nature. But that doesn't mean that we agree with Rome, that we should pray to her, uh, look to her as a mediator to help us draw near to Jesus. Remember, Jesus is, in their view, such an austere figure that we can't come directly to him. We need his mother to kind of soften him up a little bit before we can come to him. Uh, but the Bible tells us otherwise. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is one God, 
and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. Now, Mary again is blessed, but she is no mediator, and we do not pray to her. We pray to Jesus essentially only, or at least trust him alone for our prayers to be acceptable to God. Now, notice also Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord. Sometimes you'll hear Mary referred to as the mother of God, okay? Uh, Rome likes to call her the mother of God. They also historically have called her uh, by this technical term Theotokos, which means basically the one who is carrying God, okay, or the mother of God. I once heard a Jesuit priest when he was debating Walter Martin, and I, th I think it was, it was perhaps, um, there might have been somebody else there, but debating Walter Martin on this whole idea of, of how the Roman Catholic Church views Mary, and he appealed to this title, the mother of God, to mean that in some way Jesus derived his, not just his humanity, but his deity from Mary. Now, that, I do, I do not believe the Roman Catholic Church agrees with that. This particular priest seemed to think this was true, but that is blasphemy. He does get his human nature from Mary, but he doesn't get his divinity from her. Now, historically, the phrase or the title, Mother of God, was only meant to say that the one that, that Mary was carrying is, in fact, God, okay? And with that, we certainly agree. So we're not afraid of the term Theotokos or the mother of God. We just need to remember that that doesn't mean that Jesus gets his divinity from Mary. It just means that Mary was carrying one who actually is the eternal God who is in our nature. Now, finally, we see Mary filled with the Holy Spirit, exalting the Lord. Now, this section has been historically called the Magnificat. I think uh, perhaps if you have those paragraph titles in, in your Bibles, you might see it as, as mine does, um, uh, listed there. Magnificat essentially means Mary's exaltation, Mary's magnifying of the Lord. Not her magnif being magnified, but her magnifying the Lord. Uh, it's also known as the Song of Mary, the Canticle of Mary, and in the Byzantine or Greek tradition, it is called the Ode of the Theotokos, which again, I explained earlier, means uh, the, the one who bears God. So it's the Ode or the song of the one who is bearing God. Now, some see in this uh, section, this, this passage of Mary, an echo of the song that Hannah sang to the Lord when he answered her prayer for a child. And I think we, we definitely want to see here that what Mary says here and what, Zach, what we're going to see Zacharias see this evening, if, if this were in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, you would not be able to tell the difference between what they're saying and what the psalmist wrote. This reads like an Old Testament psalm. And I think it allows us to make a connection between, you know, again, the types and shadows of the Old Covenant, which are in the psalms, and how those are fulfilled in the New Testament, so that when we read the book of Psalms, we can see how those types basically come across in spiritual ways which we see here. And we actually see three things here. First of all, we see Mary praising the Lord for sending the Redeemer into the world. One thing we should bear out here is that she calls God my Savior. Now, she, like all the rest of us, was guilty and she needed to be redeemed from her sins. Now, it's interesting, you know, Roman Catholicism, again, uh, we're, we're sort of contrasting their view because this, this is an area they love to spend time in. Uh, so I think some of us have been led to believe that Roman Catholicism believes that Mary um, did not need a redeemer. And I think uh, some of the things they say actually lead us to that conclusion, although that is not necessarily their view. They believe that Mary was immaculately conceived, that, and when you go deeper into what they mean by that, what they mean is that the merit of, of the work of Jesus was actually applied to her at the very moment that she was conceived so that she never became guilty of Adam's sin and she never inherited original sin. In other words, she was pure and holy in the womb 
immaculately conceived, but only because of what Jesus Christ had done. Now, let me just mention, that isn't true, okay? We don't find this anywhere in the Bible. If she had never become guilty, she would not have needed really a Savior. She's rejoicing in God, my Savior. Is she thinking, well, it's because he immaculately conceived me? I don't think so. I think that's pure un, you know, speculation that has no grounds in the Scripture. Now, some within Roman Catholicism also go as far as to say that even though, some would say even though she was born immaculate, she still fell and sinned. Others would say she never did sin, but lived a life that was completely pure from her, her birth to her death, as well as remaining a perpetual virgin. But again, this is contrary to what Mary is clearly saying here. She's rejoicing in what the Lord is doing, fulfilling His promise to Abraham. She's rejoicing with Elizabeth, the Lord is sending the Savior into the world. And why is she rejoicing? Because He's my Savior. I need Him. I am guilty like the rest. So then how could Jesus be you know, born without sin if He is born of a sinful mother? Well, the easy answer to that, of course, is He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit creates is pure and holy. And that's exactly what Jesus is. So first of all, she's rejoicing in God, her Savior. She needed a Savior like the rest of us. Secondly, we see her praising the Lord for, again, choosing her to be the one who would bring this blessed one into the world, or at least be the vessel through whom the Lord would do this, purely by His mercy and grace. Now, again, I think we see in this passage here Mary's self-perception. You know, self that she was, saw herself as lowly, saw herself as a humble bond slave. Why would she see herself this way if she was perfect? Okay, she wasn't perfect. But again, a savior, a, a sinner who needed a savior, humbled by her sin, humbled by the Lord's mercy and his grace. But here's the point again. That's the reason why she was chosen, is because she was humble, because she was lowly. God doesn't use the proud. God doesn't use the mighty. He doesn't use the noble. He doesn't use the people that the world thinks highly of in order to glorify himself. He chooses those the world think very, thinks very lowly of in order to glorify himself. He gives to the poor, and he sends the rich away empty-handed. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 29, just to remind us again, because Mary is saying exactly the same thing here that Paul says here. He says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. I mean, sometimes we might look at ourselves and we might say, you know, I wish I was smarter than I am. I wish I was stronger than I am. I wish I was better looking than I am. I wish that I was more of a celebrity than I am. I wish I had more wealth than I have. And there's all these things we might wish that we had. I mean, I think we all go through that at some point. But those aren't the kind of people the Lord chooses to use. He chooses those that the world thinks very little of because when he uses them to do mighty things, it shows the world how great he is and not how great that person is. God doesn't want somebody who's going to exalt themselves. He wants to show himself strong through our weakness. And the encouragement for us here is we don't have to be great to be useful to the Lord. All we need to be is humble. So she again rejoices the Lord chose her to do this. Um, she who was very humble, very lowly, very meek. And then finally, she praises the Lord again for his faithfulness toward Abraham and his children in sending his son to save them. Verses 54 and 55. He has given help to Israel, his servants, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now, you know, all these different things that Mary is saying, we could spend a great deal of time on, and we don't have time to do that because we're dealing with big chunks, but we will deal with those things as we go through the Gospel of Luke. But one thing I want you to be reminded of here is this. 
Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. He is the fulfillment we're going to see this evening of the Davidic covenant. Uh, he is the fulfillment of the new covenant. What we are seeing right now is fulfillment. Uh, remember what um, the Lord said to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus is the one that God promised to Israel, but not Israel alone. He is the one promised to the whole world. That's why Jesus sent his disciples to the whole world. Make disciples of all the nations. Not because this is plan B and God is waiting to fulfill his plan for Israel in the future, but because this is what God intended. He was going to be a blessing to all the nations and that's what we see happening. That's what's going on now. Everyone who puts his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And that is how all the nations will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. So let me just close by saying this. If we would see heaven, if we would make it there eventually, this is the only one who can get us there. We don't look to Mary. She's blessed. Sure, she's blessed. She was bearing one who is our Savior, God in human flesh. He's the one that we need to look to. He's the only one that can get us there. And that is what the table again reminds us of this morning. So as we uh, finish this particular part of the service and we begin to move towards the Lord's table, let's, let's bear in mind that there is no other way. The reason why Mary rejoiced so much was because the only one who could possibly save her and save her people and save God's people was coming into the world through her. And that was a tremendous, tremendous responsibility and a tremendous blessing, but an opportunity to rejoice. Let, let's rejoice as well because Jesus, we know, was not only born, but he grew up, he ministered, he gave his life on the cross so that all who trust in him would not perish but have eternal life. So let's do two things as we pray for just a couple of moments. Let's ask the Lord to apply the things that we've seen, and let's also ask him to prepare us to come to the table. Right, let's pray.